Yeah, I think so. Did they? Yes. Uh, we were running late, so I'm going to talk uber fast as we go through this. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, I just don't want to make y'all late for the FBI session. If you are struggling in this area and you want to stay in here and talk to me after this, I'm happy to sit in here and talk to you. So if you don't decide to go to the FBI session and you want to talk more about this topic, we can, since we're going to have to truncate it. And I actually spent time truncating it earlier, because I was like, oh, I got a lot of slides. And then people who have gone through my classes were like, you, a lot of slides? Really? No surprise there whatsoever. I love teaching this class. What? No. I have 31. I, I, had 60, I had 63. <laughs> I got. Um, so I love teaching this class. I've taught it at several different conferences, and several people sitting in here have actually had this session before. I will say every time I teach this, I realize how bad I'm doing personally. And so I think it's something that you can hear over and over and over again. I'm going to talk about some different tools that I use. I'm going to talk about some other tools that are out there and we'll solicit feedback from all of you. I, I also said I need to really figure out how to update this particular slide. Although it's when he was the cutest. He was one. He had just learned how to walk. I know because we took him out of his daycare. Um, about a month after this because I got a call from the day care going, oh, he's so cute and he's so talented. He opened the door to the play area, you know, the cage play area, and let every child in his class out onto the playground. Yes. And I'm like, he's one. You're supposed to have two teachers watching one-year-olds at all times. So, yeah, we're not paying $1,500 to you anymore. No, we moved him. So that's how I know, because I remember him falling asleep at the time. So as we talk through this, we'll probably hear some personal stories from folks in the audience. You'll also want to take a test. I realize there's no paper in here for you to take your test with, but y'all can count in your head or do it on your phone, um, because it's a good way to figure out how you're doing. When we think about stress, and we think about work-life fit, and we think about all the challenges that we're facing every day, who feels stressed out? What are you stressed about? Who doesn't? Not enough time in the day. Too many responsibilities. Too many projects. Too many projects. What did you forget? That's just age. <laughs> 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 I can pick on the same a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, we're going to talk about it. It's not really age that causes memory loss. What else? Happy. <laughs> Staffing. Or, or staff in general. Or staff in general. Or, or users. No budget. No budget. Okay, let's talk about like work stuff. Is work what really stresses you out? Oh, How old is she? Twenty-four. Yeah. <laughs> is she living at your house? No. Oh well, then you're blessed. You should start praying. Thank, thank you, Lord. I do She's not have a boomerang crumb snatcher. Oh, see, boomerang crumb snatcher right there. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, because they boomerang crown snatchers. Because, by the way, over 50% of all millennials, that 25 year old age range, not any of the good looking people sitting in here that are possibly in that age range, um, are unemployed. Or underemployed. Unemployed or underemployed. And so most of them are living at home with their parents. You know why? Because they can be on your insurance until they're 26. Right? Yeah, if you didn't know that, that was a fascinating change that happened. I was like, man, I would have never gotten out of the nest if I had all those options available to me. My parents said, there's college, you go, you never come back. Don't come back, yeah. Until we're old enough to need you, and we will live with you. <laughs> <laughs> you might hear stress out about elder care. Yeah. How? Yeah. Elder care has been an unbelievably challenging experience. I was telling somebody, I left last night, I left yesterday to drive home because my parents are in the process of fighting with one nursing home to move to another nursing home for my grandmother who's 91 years old and they were supposed to watch my son for me who's seven and they can't do everything. And by the way, they're in their 70s so then they get run down. Right? There's this compounding thing. So I drove home, watched, got my son to school this morning, and drove right back here. I guess where I'm going tonight. Back home. Because they need to move her tomorrow, the rest of her stuff, because apparently she collected a lot. 
in her nursing home, and apparently she feels attached to it. I was like, no, you put your foot down like you would with a child, but okay. So elder care is a huge stressor right now. If you have an elderly person living in your house, raise your hand. I don't mean yourself. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a, one of your parents or in-laws. Okay, oh, mother-in-law, yeah. So there's all sorts of issues there. Um, so if you have your mother-in-law living with you is almost worse in many cases than having children living with you. Yeah, just like you'd accept they're adults. Right. Which is really a weird experience. And my neighbor has Alzheimer's. I've been watching him slowly deteriorate over the last two years. And, and I say slowly, it's not been slow at all. And I look at his wife and I'm like, wow, I cannot imagine every day not knowing which John we get. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is the reality of all of us because we're living a really stinking long time now. Mm -hmm. I have an aunt who's 104. Mm -hmm. Every day she prays for the sweet delivery of death. She does. And every day she wakes up pissed off. <laughs> but she's out with most of her children, right? Because we now have procedures that allow us. So we're going to talk about this sort of work-life balancing. I've never been able to effectively talk about the elder care impact until this week. Because, you know, it would happen the week of the conference that I would have all of these issues sort of manifest. But one of the challenges we have right now is that the way we're working isn't productive. How many of you routinely work more than 40 hours a week? Shame on you. I know, Rick, I know you like it. I know you think it's good for you, right? I sat with a group of IT professionals, who many of them are on our board, on Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday evening. Belina was there too, I think. And we were watching a funny video about the way <coughs> men and women think differently. Did you see that video, Belina? Mm -mm. You came up afterwards. Mm -hmm. It was hilarious. By the way, if you ever want to see something funny, it's this marriage counselor. He talks about men brains and women brains. And he talks about there's this box in the man brain called the nothing box <laughs> that women have no concept about and that nothing makes a woman matter than a man who's doing and thinking about nothing. <laughs> and that's their favorite box on the entire planet to go to. Every man in here is like, yes, yes. And so I'm talking to these adults that I think are just like unbelievably intellectual, talented, CIO, senior level folks. Every one of them plays video games. What's wrong with that? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing box, because that's a man, nothing box. I and mean, there's women that play video games too, but it's a really interesting thing because you work so many hours and then you come home and you're supposed to be like an engaged partner, heaven forbid, or an engaged parent, or an engaged child that's taking care of whatever the issues are, right? And so we've got this really extreme situation going on in our workforce. People are working entirely too long. And they're wasting a lot of time while they're at work. How many of you go to meetings? No. I mean, I'm not talking about this session. But on average, how many hours a week do you waste in meetings? 15, 40. 42. 42 out of the 40 hours. 10 to 20, depending on what your job is. Right? How many hours a week do you waste interpreting an email that came from someone trying to figure out what their feelings were when they wrote it? <laughs> like, that's a woman thing. Men, nothing box, enjoy it when you read the emails, right? So we've got to figure out how to fix this. I love this, I use this every single time, most of this I use every single time I teach this class, and I realize that this is the world that all of us are living in. We are so busy, worried about getting things done, that we never stop to figure out if we're doing the right things. Anybody had that wake-up call? Several of you. Several of you I know personally, and you've had that wake-up call, right? And it's usually a really traumatic wake-up call that you have of, huh, we probably should have taken a vacation in the last 10 years, Rick. That's a good one. First time, last, last year. year, in 10 years, and it was a pivotal moment that caused him to take a vacation. There was a sad moment at the time that turned out really great. His son had cancer, and he's 18 months. 18 months. So we're super happy, and Drew's about the cutest kid you've ever wanted to see. Mm -hmm. And so that moment sort of coalesced into him changing the way that he was operating. All of us have a story like that. It could be something not sad, the birth of a child, adopting a child, becoming a step-parent, getting divorced, getting married, I don't care what option it is, there's something that will happen in your life
that makes you realize that you're checking off the box. Anybody do that? They go to the gym and they check in on Facebook. Anybody do that? Yeah, yeah, you go to the gym, you check it on Facebook, and I watch people, and they're in there for two hours. I'm like, what? They're on their phone. You sat on the machine, and you pretended like you were going to use it for two hours while you texted. It doesn't count. Do you check the box at work? Do you check the box at home? Honestly, think about that. How many times are you sitting on the couch next to people that you are supposed to love and take care of, and you zoned out? and you're not engaged. And maybe it's because you're married and failing and that's perfectly fine and maybe you should just get out of it. I'm not saying if you're married, don't please. Like if you're married and you're sitting together, please don't like start nodding your head. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time we're checking the box. As a matter of fact, on a regular basis I have to remind myself not to check the box. Even though I teach classes on this almost every month, all over the country, and I still check the box. You're going to get your homework done. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. You're going to do this. And there's no room for variation in my life or anybody else's life because of checking the box. Right? A good mom does X. A good worker does Y. A good worker works 80 hours a week. A good worker in the IT world gets it done no matter what. Anybody here follow that model? I get it done no matter what. Wake up, Paul. You will get fired one day, or you will die one day, and they will find someone to replace you who's also going to get it done no matter what. And it's a cycle we perpetuate in our organizations that we need to stop. Because it's the reason we don't get enough funding, we don't get enough staffing, and all sorts of other issues. And it's the reason that you're miserable at work. Work should be awesome. Every day I wake up, my son goes, Mommy, I don't want to go to school today. I'm like, dude, suck it up. The rest of your life, you're going to do things you don't want to do. And he says, do you like work? I love work. Every day I get to go to work, I love work. He says, why? And I say, because I went to school for a lot of years, years and years and years beyond what you even can consider. I went to school for all those years, and I hated every minute of it, but now I get to love my work, so I paid my dues, right? He doesn't, he's seven, he doesn't get that. He's just like, yeah, I'm going to get through high school. <laughs> you know, forever, you know, and you're going to buy me a sports car, that's what he's thought so far. Here's your test. First test. You can write it down. You don't have to. Just remember your score. I want you to count the number of times you say true. I don't regularly get seven eight hours of sleep and or I fill up, wake up feeling tired. Frequently skip breakfast or settle for something that's not healthy. Don't do cardiovascular training three times a week, uh, strength training twice a week. By the way, those can be blended. Simply walking around your buildings at work can count as cardiovascular. Anything that's weight bearing counts as strength training. Don't regularly take breaks during the day to renew and recharge. I often eat lunch at my desk if I eat lunch at all. You and a year score of five. Now, damn it, Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> I know. She I went know. through my class. <laughs> no, no, you missed this class, didn't you? You was missed it, this class. Was oh, it in this February? Is the one class you missed. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> this is pretty easy to fix, guys. How easy is it to go to bed a little earlier? What are you doing that prevents you from going to bed? My spouse won't go to bed earlier. <laughs> Leave them behind. Okay, see that's see, okay, yeah, okay, so you may have a policy that you go to bed together. Your spouse won't go to bed earlier. You could probably entice her to go to bed earlier. I'm just saying. Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> boy. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs> it's going to get bad. But most of us are brain dead at night. And we're watching TV. Right? We're just sitting there watching TV. Or we get up artificially earlier or something like that. If you have children that wake you up, I'm sorry. I don't know how to fix that for you. Wake up feeling tired. Who wakes up feeling tired? Who doesn't sleep well? And Ed said this to me at the gym two days ago, or yesterday it was. Yeah, I get up every night for like a couple hours in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. There's some really cool ways to solve that problem. Rubber I mean, hammer. Booze. You what? A rubber hammer. Yeah, rubber hammer. I was the booze. No, not booze. <laughs> Simple things. Natural things. You can take melatonin. Wow, that's unbelievably bright. You can take <laughs> melatonin, right, and that might solve the problem. Probably what's happening, and, and we'll talk about the physical the responses to stress, Probably what's happening is that your rhythms are off. Everybody operates in rhythms. When your rhythms get off artificially, you have to reset them. 
is the greatest tip I've ever learned. Number one, I bought a sleep mask. I used to make fun of the girls that wore those little sleep masks. It is amazing. It is amazing because it keeps the light out. And the minute I see the light, and I, y'all sleep with your phones. I know you do. Your phone, you got, you got Siri as your girlfriend, and you got your wife. Or your boyfriend, right? Most of you are sleeping with your phone in your room. Most of you watch TV right before bedtime. Right? So I bought the sleep mask because that was number one, and that has made a huge change in my sleep patterns. But the other thing is the sleep institutes have come out and actually said that the light that's put out by computers, Kindles, TVs, etc., there's a blue light that's put out by them. They disrupt your, your natural sleep patterns because they lower your melatonin rates. The, the mel natural melatonin in your body is substantially impacted by those. It sucks them out. They're these awesome sunglasses. I swear to God, I wear sunglasses at night, like Corey Hart said. He did not realize what he was into. They're called blue blockers. Anybody ever had blue blocker sunglasses? Anybody remember them? If you've ever gone and got your eyes dilated, they kind of look like that. But you can get some cool ones because apparently they were in the hangover movie and that made them popular. I wear blue blocker sunglasses if I'm going to watch TV or look at my computer or my phone for at least 45 minutes before bed every night because it restores your melatonin levels back to higher levels than even if you took melatonin. It's a really simple fix. How many of you are skipping breakfast? I mean, I'm not talking about the food we fed you here because we never feed you healthy things. Maybe you follow a diet that tells you to skip breakfast and that's perfectly fine, but most people drink coffee. High levels of caffeine, high levels of sugar, possibly some creamer, does not equal breakfast. There is nothing nutritional about that setup. That is actually a setup for a really nice heart attack in most cases. Cardiovascular training or weight training? How many of you go outside and play? I know you do. But most of us don't do a good job of going outside and playing. This is the big one, taking regular breaks. Who in here waits, waits until 5 o'clock and goes, wow! I haven't gone to the bathroom all day. <laughs> and most of them are women, 90% of the time women do this. And I'm like, okay, number one, you're highly dehydrated. And number two, you never took a break. All of the top CEOs of Fortune 500 companies routinely take 10 to 30 minute breaks throughout their day to become very productive. You have to walk away from whatever you're doing to actually solve problems, right? So we get out of that space. Next one, emotional. I frequently find myself feeling irritable, impatient, or anxious at work, especially when demand is high. I don't have enough time with my family and loved ones, and when I'm with them, I'm not really with them. I.e., I'm sitting on the beach on my vacation, and we're enjoying the sunshine, and the kids are out there being bitten by sharks because I'm answering work email. <laughs> Who answers work email on vacation? There's this really cool thing. It's called all home. <laughs> it's called vacation for a reason. Right? It will last. It will, it will still be there when you get back to work. I promise you it is. I, don't, I take too little time for activities I most deeply enjoy. I rarely stop to express appreciation to others or to savor what I have as a blessing or accomplishment. I feel like my life is a relentless set of demands that I'm expected to meet and tasks I have to complete. complete. If that last one really resonates with you, stay with me afterwards because we should talk about that. This is a pretty brutal place to be in, and I don't want anybody to be in that space necessarily. Anybody get five? You're getting close. I, Raquel, you were high last year. It's gotten worse. Okay, because you were like a 17 last year on that total score, I thought. But maybe I was wrong. Mental steps. I have difficulty focusing on one thing at a time. I'm easily distracted by email. Spend my time reacting to immediate demands rather than focusing on activities with longer-term value and leverage. I don't spend enough time reflecting and strategizing and thinking creatively. I rarely have any time where I'm, when my mind is free and quiet of thoughts. Men apparently don't have that issue because of the nothing box. <laughs> I often work on weekends and evenings and I rarely take an email free vacation. Anybody at five? This one's a little bit harder and we're going to talk about some strategies that we go through. Spirituality and the way that we define spirituality is actually figuring out what your value base is and then having your actions meet that value base. It's not about religion at all. I don't feel passionately committed to what I do. I spend too little time at work doing what I do best and enjoy the most. Significant gaps between what I say is important in my life and how I actually live. My decisions at work are more influenced by external demands than a strong, clear sense of my own purpose. 
I don't invest enough time and energy into making a positive difference in the world. Five and five. Public servants usually score really low on this one. They're closer to a zero, one, two, which is awesome because we do feel passionate about the work we do. We feel like there's a bigger commitment to a, a larger body. So I, I don't have as many concerns in the public sector space about this one, but there are days where we get in the rat race and our decisions are governed by things that are not actually the right sorts of things to be governing us. If I added all your scores together, meaning the four elements, did anybody have below five? You would have had a zero, a one, or a two on <coughs> any one of those four areas or all of those four areas. You did? Yeah? Wow, you got it figured out. You can leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, if, if you had all the faults, if you feel good about all those areas, right? She's not lying. She's my coworker. And she's, she's not stressed out. It's just easy going, laid back. It might just be part of your personality type. But it also means you figured out how to prioritize what matters. And in that space, the word you is fitting in. We've worked for about a year and a half. Uh-huh. And when I decided to come back to work, I was just clear about what I wanted to do. So you set boundaries. Look at that. It's amazing what happens when you set boundaries. I told somebody recently, I was talking to a mom whose kids are getting ready to go into kindergarten, and I said, let me just tell you, the worst year of my life was last year with my son starting kindergarten. You would think it would not be a bad year. When he was in daycare, it was no big deal because every kid in daycare had working parents. You send your kid to public school, and there's that group of moms and, and dads, but mostly moms, who are outside the school every day to pick their kid up at the door. And your kid's like, Mommy, why do I got to go to after care? Don't you love me? Right? For a year, I went through this. And so I would find myself rushing home from work, trying to get to school before it got to be like a certain artificial time that I had set in my mind as what was acceptable and not acceptable. You know, and there's all kinds of kids with bad parents who leave those kids there until six. <laughs> right? The BTA president talks about this. <laughs> the group of mommies, I call them the Yummy Mummy Club. The Yummy Mummy Club, that wears their Lululemon and goes to the gym apparently all day, because I don't know why they look like that otherwise. They <laughs> talk about it. Right? So in this space, I take this test. This is a test that comes from a, a sort of an audit that you can do called the energyaudit.com. It's a website. It's fantastic. I take this test every week. If my number creeps up into that 15 range, I take a day off, period. No questions asked. Because I know that Chernobyl meltdown is going to happen. If I'm in 17 to 20, meaning you scored lots of fours and fives, you are in Chernobyl meltdown. And by the way, nobody's getting the best of you. If you say yes to everything, you're really saying no to excellence. You're never going to be good at anything you care about if you're constantly saying yes to things. So as we go through this, we're going to talk about sort of this inverted Maslow's hierarchy. Physicality, what can I do about my physical being? I, I tease because I come to these conferences and all I see is us hopping you up with caffeine, sugar, and simple carbohydrates. I hope everybody's dealing you amphetamines here. Um, if they are, I wish you could talk to me because I might need some. But, and then we take you out and give you as much alcohol as possible. <laughs> like we are the antithesis of this thought. Right? And overeating. It's a fascinating sort of world that we live in. This is not where we want to live. This is low octane living, high octane living. People always ask me, what should my diet look like? Here's a really simple suggestion. Make half of your plate a lean protein. I don't mean meat, I mean a lean protein. It can be beans, it can be meat, it can be fish, it can be whatever it is you like. You can combine vegetables to make a protein source. Half your plate's protein. The other half of it is a mix of complex carbohydrates, not simple carbohydrates, right? Fruit is good for you. Just don't believe the advertisements. Fruit is your friend, right? Jelly is not, fruit is your friend. <laughs> Movement exercise. I don't know that there's anything more important in, in the space of energizing than movement and exercise. Inez didn't sleep for two hours in the middle of the night, last night, or two nights ago, and her little tail was in the gym at 7 a.m., right? Is that when I saw you there about 7 a.m.? She was in the gym at 7 a.m. She was working out really hard. 
And then 20 minutes later, she looked beautiful and was in class. And I was like, okay, what's up with that? And then I realized she got her mojo going, right? She got her energy going. She got herself sort of reset by doing movement. And it was fascinating because she I, she doesn't even know what I'm talking about her. I didn't know she's going to be sitting in here to talk about her. But every time she did a, a, a sort of a movement, like a weight-based movement, she would go and stretch right afterwards. And then I thought, that's why her legs look so good. I'm a little jealous, but Stop. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> she's like, more importantly than all of that is playing and laughing. How many of you play? And, oh, I know you play all day every day, because, and I know you have to laugh all day every day because she plays all day every day. Um, and so if you're on Sandy's team, you're blessed, and, and we'll just put you in a different box because the, the rest of us, I don't play at work a lot. It's not something more recent. We don't play. We kid each other back and forth. But we don't really play at work. I mean, I'm not going to go out and shoot basketball with Maurice because I'm 5'2 and he's like 6'0 something. And he's really good and I'm really bad. Like, can't even throw a ski ball properly at the, at the play place. So, what can you do? Anybody do like Nerf Wars with your team in the afternoons, Friday afternoon? That's a good idea. <laughs> Glenn Hastead, who is not here, and some of you may actually work for him, I'm not sure. Uh, he's the new CIO down in Onslow County, I believe. He came from High Point. On Friday afternoons, or after a big project, I remember him telling me that they would have Nerf Wars. They just bought some Nerf guns and would put them out in the office, and people would just, there, there is nothing more fascinating than watching human beings shoot each other with devices that can't actually hurt. Or, or punch things. Sandy and I talk about this all the time. In my office, which I don't get stressed out very much, but in my office I have a fantastic resource that all of you can afford to buy right now. They sell it at the Dollar Tree. And if you're really lucky, they have it in the machine. It only costs 25 cents, and you might get the one. But it might cost you $50 to actually get the one. Okay. It's called a punching balloon. Y'all remember the punching balloon? Yeah. I have them in my office. I have a stack of them in my office because when I get stressed out, even if I'm stressed out of people in my personal life or people in my work life, I blow it up and you'll hear this. And that's Shannon with her punching balloon. The door's shut. But it's awesome because it reminds me of my childhood. It reminds me of how important it is to laugh and play. And you cannot hit a punching balloon, even if you miss it, without feeling good. I think we should give those nickel cheese a punching balloon next year. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that on the list. Actually, now, how do you relax? You have to take breaks. You need to nap. You <clears throat> could meditate. I don't, but you could. You have to sleep enough. There's a really simple strategy. We actually use it with small children every single day. How many of you say you need to take a moment and breathe before you react? Breathe in. Breathe out. I do this with the judges. I teach this to the North Carolina judges. And I always make them shut their eyes and practice breathing. And I say, I want you to clear your mind. And the men can do it. And the women are not. And I say, clear your mind. And think about absolutely nothing. And I want you to practice breathing for five minutes. Or for, for one minute. One minute. Quietly. And about 20 seconds in, people start going like this. <laughs> right? And they can't clear their minds. At times, I've put heart rate monitors on them to see what's happening. By the way, they feel very stressed out about being in a room with their eyes closed. <laughs> heart rate automatically goes up. So now, I say to them after we get done after 30 seconds, I'm like, by the way, it was only 30 seconds. And they're like, it felt like a lifetime. We don't know how you do that. And then I say, okay, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to shut your eyes, and I want you to count your breath. I want you to in for five, and I want you to exhale for five. Or if you're a yoga person, it might be a different number. But inhale for five, exhale for five. And you're going to count quietly in your head, not out loud, that the beauty of the human brain is it can't multitask. So if I'm actually breathing and thinking about my breath and counting my breath, I can do nothing else but count my breath. I can't have any other thoughts. I'm in. You can't. It's impossible. All of you can try it right now. The best thing is in one minute, we can see substantial rates of lowering heart rate, and blood pressure in one minute. So when you get mad at work, we always tell you to walk away and breathe, but it actually improves your stress levels. You have to start sleeping more. In a perfect world, we would take naps. It isn't gonna happen. No government employee should be found sleeping on their desk between one and three p.m. Power naps are the best. How many of you take power naps? What do you consider a power nap? How long is it? 10 to 15? 20? 
everybody has an ideal number that their body likes. My body likes seven minutes. If I ever get enough time to sit down for seven minutes and try to actively take a nap, I wake up exactly seven minutes later. In as little as three minutes, your body feels the restorative effects of sleep. Three minutes. All the science used to say you couldn't catch up on sleep. Now it says you can. As long as you catch up on that sleep within a 24-hour period of when you lost the sleep. So you can take a three-minute nap in the potty, and nobody would know. They don't really ask you what you're doing in there. <laughs> vacation is not optional, Rick. Rick took his first vacation in 10 years. Does that sound sad to some of you? And how many of the rest of you are going, yep, yeah, pretty much? You know why? Because local government or state agencies, etc., let us bank our vacation and sick leave. And I know I'm going to retire seven years early <laughs> because we're saving all that. Guess what? You're going to be dead and it doesn't matter. And they don't pay it out to your beneficiaries. You don't get it. So you have to take vacation. Most of the larger companies have moved to a required vacation process. IBM, four weeks minimum of vacation. And if you don't take it, you lose it. They do it because they don't want to pay the retirement at the end, but they also do it because they know their employees come back more refreshed after taking vacation. How long is a vacation? Ideally, four weeks. You went 10 days, right? You went 10 days. Two weeks would be perfect. I would probably go crazy after like 10 days. 10 days is about the ideal. You want both weekends and a full week. Why? Because it takes at least two days for you to stop thinking about work or the house and the burner that you left on or whatever it is. <laughs> two days. And then usually one to two days before you come off of vacation, you start thinking about work or the house or the laundry that's piled up or the fact that there's no groceries in your house and the kids are going to have to go to school on Monday and you're not going to pack their lunch. Maybe that's just me, but that's the world that we all live in. Sumo wrestler diet. I always go, people, who follows this? And then I show it to them. You never, uh, you skip breakfast, you never eat before noon, and you consume one to two huge meals in a day, and then you go to sleep. Here, we at least give you alcohol and you dance. <laughs> so it's okay. That produces the highest level of fat storage in your fat cells possible. So everybody has a set number of fat cells. This ensures that they are as plump as they can possibly be. Let's talk about the security zone, which was your emotional status. Some of us live in this world. I, I mean, there are, actually, I said this yesterday. I texted, just so you know, I'm not putting up with any dog bad work when I get home. The children better be on it. Homework is not negotiable. They better do it. Everybody's going to eat with the heck I cook. <laughs> Mama ain't going to play today. If she done had to deal with the crazy registration system, had people standing in line for two hours, right? So she's not playing. I was in survival zone. Instantly I walk in the door. And, and I walk in the door and my very sweet, loving partner hands me my boxing gloves and he says, go. Go. I'm like, go where? He's like, go out. Go out on the back deck because we have boxing stuff on the back deck. He says, I don't care if you hit it twice, but you need to go hit something. It ain't going to be him, apparently, yesterday. <laughs> 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 When you're in that space, the scary part about that space is that it ultimately leads to this space. And this is the space where I have the biggest concerns. I have lost loved ones to suicide. I have lost IT friends to suicide. I have had friends survive attempts. I had someone come in my office after teaching this class to a municipal and county administration course that we run. And he was a really high ranking police officer. He was an assistant chief, and I'm not gonna say where he was from. But he came in my office after I talked this. He gave me a business card and said, I need to talk to you. And I never, nobody ever does that. He walks in and he says, can we shut your door? And I'm thinking, I'm getting arrested. <laughs> I said, yes, sir, we can shut the door. He shuts the door and this grown man who did not know me before that day fell apart. Fell apart. And I said, are you okay? And he said, I was going to run my car off the road and make it look like an accident on my way home from this class today. Wow. Because I'm here. 
It is not a set. It, it is not something that we talk about very often. And it literally was a function of him taking a job. We finally we, we sort of talked about it, and I called his wife and, and with his permission, and we got him some actual psychiatric help because I'm not qualified to have those conversations, quite frankly. But ultimately, it came down, and what he said to her on the phone was, "I took the job as the assistant chief because I wanted to keep moving upwards." I wanted to have more money. I wanted to give you the life I thought you deserved. But I'm a cop. All I do is push paper all day long and listen to people's complaints. That's not being a cop. I don't solve crime. I don't help the public. I don't do that anymore. And I, so, so he's talking to his wife, and she said, then quit. Go back to being a detective. Go back to being a beat cop. I don't care. The money doesn't matter if you're dead. Right? And so you have to have those sorts of conversations with someone, whoever it is, that you feel comfortable with. Performance zone. When you're in the performance zone, it's awesome. It means that you're challenged and engaged and invigorated. Or you get to go to the renewal zone where you're going to be peaceful. I cannot wait for this weekend after this conference is over because we're going to just chill. I've already made my plans except the weather is not cooperating. I was like, I'm going to go fishing because apparently that's where men go for the nothing box. <laughs> <laughs> coming at us at any given time for us to actually pay attention to anything. Think about it. Have you ever gone to dinner and looked around you? I see people on first dates who spend the entire time on their phone. I see couples who have been married for a really long time who spend the entire time on their phone and never actually talk to each other. Maybe that's a good strategy for staying married. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I know on a first date it's not a good strategy. We've got this issue. I love this quote. I learned this quote in graduate school, and it had nothing to do with this. But it's about really distilling down to what matters and figuring out how to get rid of all this information. How do we actually start focusing? There's a wonderful rule out there that has been proven scientifically over and over again. It's called the 490 rule. If you will devote no more than, no more, let me be clear, no more than four hours a day, never more than 90 minutes at a time, to whatever it is that needs to get done in your life, <coughs> write, a pro, write a paper, tell this to your students, by the way, your, your children that are students, because four hours a day, never more than 90 minutes at a time, you take a break after 90 minutes with 100% focus, no emails, no phones, none of that coming in, you will produce approximately three times the amount of work in that same period. People cannot multitask. We are under this myth of multitasking, and it is absolutely not something that people are capable of doing. We are capable of combining tasks like driving home and not remembering how we got there, but it's not multitasking. It's called the unbearable automaticity of being, which means your brain has melded a way for your body to do certain functions without it, with, with it going on autopilot, right? It's why chickens can continue to run after their heads are cut off, or snakes continue to slither after their heads are cut off. I don't do those things at my house, but I've seen them happen. <laughs> we know that it takes 25% longer to complete tasks if you do part of a task and then switch to the next part of a task and then switch to the next part of a task than if you would do a single-minded focus on one task and follow it all the way through. I call it the squirrel. Does anybody do that? Have you ever seen the movie Up? Squirrel, right? We do that all the time. Our brains are being conditioned to do that. So we're in this space where we have this constant battle in our brains. The really interesting thing about the human brain is it acts a lot like, I love shark week, I'm obsessed with sharks. It acts a lot like sharks. Has anybody ever seen a shark going for a bite? I mean, not personally. But you watch Shark Week. What happens with the eyeballs? No. Right? There's like this white thing. It looks like they're rolling back. It's a white membrane that comes down over their eyeballs. Why? Because the eyeball is one of the most sensitive parts of the shark. So if you get attacked, hit it in the nose and the eyes. Enough, enough editorializing about shark attacks. Um, so it rolls this membrane down because it wants to protect it. The brain does the same thing. The brain will shut off the basic parts of the brain that tell you to have feeling, emotion, empathy, rationale when it is faced with a fight or flight situation. It's why if your child was under a car, you little tiny person could pick up a giant car to get it off your child. Right? That's fight or flight response. It's why when you have a fight with your loved one and you know you are crazy and wrong, that you still fight. Because the brain has shut off that part 
The cool thing about the brain is we can train it. We can actually train it to have less of a response to those fight or flight situations. By inducing small amounts of fear and change routinely over time. People always laugh at me, they're like, you do some crazy things. I'm like, yeah, all the time. Every year I pick something that terrifies me and I do it. I stood on stage in a bikini and I painted a weird brown color. <laughs> and let people judge me for how I looked. You talk about the worst day of your life, that's pretty much it for a woman that's 40. Right? Maybe at 20 I would have been fine. At 40 it was horrible and I had to wear fake eyelashes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> fake eyelashes are the devil. But I do things like that because I want to be terrified. So that my brain doesn't have these crazy responses to stress. And I know that I can control it. Because I can train my brain by scaring it a little bit every day. Don't mean text and drive, by the way. That is not the way to scare your brain routinely. <laughs> Bad is stronger than good. Human beings are fascinating people. We have figured out... How to remember the one time somebody gave you a bad evaluation. The one time you didn't do a project correctly. The one time as an instructor that you wrote something negative on my evaluation. I remember the one. You remember, you can right now go back in your brain and remember some teacher in high school that put a lot of red on your papers. Junior high. Junior high. I can remember it from fourth grade. I used a word called devour, and she said I wasn't old enough to know that word, and she told my parents I cheated. Fourth grade. Oh, yeah. Field day. With that one, no, I won. It was all good. But, <laughs> bad is stronger than good. Human beings are conditioned to remember the bad. It's not just your wives, fellas. It's all of us. We remember the bad. Now, mental status. Your mental status. When you are in stress in any of these areas, you start facing this reactive zone, or maybe the scattered zone. You're shallow and inefficient, impulsive, or you're completely indiscriminate. We don't want to be over there. We want to be on the tactical side. We want to be logical and analytical and task-oriented when we need to be focused. And then when we don't need to be focused, we want to go work with Sandy, where we get to do big picture thinking. Those of you who don't know Sandy, and Brandon, I could not remember your name, and Preston, they have the coolest jobs on the planet. They're in a giant room with balls. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> with padded walls, yeah, they have, and couches. And their job is to think up new ideas. Can you imagine working in a local government that paid you to do what you love, which is think up new ideas? Mecklenburg County has moved into that space. And I think it is so cool. That's why none of them scored above a three on any of those assessment areas, probably, because they have about the coolest jobs. They get to live in this space, which is awesome. Somebody else, I hope, is living in the task-oriented space, right, getting yeah. the, the actual work done. Here's the cool thing about the human brain. We know that the human brain works with both parts of its hemispheres, right? We've got the right brain and the left brain. Most of us, depending on which hand you operate from, are actually left brain thinkers. We're overly logical. Does anybody ever accuse you of being overly logical? Right? But you don't understand how I feel like your 14 year old daughter. You don't understand how I feel, mom. So when you're overly logical, you need to go to the other side. The cool thing about the brain is that that right brain is the creative brain, which is where they get to live more than the rest of us. That creative brain actually solves problems much faster. If you can engage in a creative process related to or unrelated to whatever problem you're trying to solve, you will have roughly 30% better problem resolution and better, better problem solving by doing that. I don't care if you go draw a picture, if you color, there's this weird adult coloring movement that I don't really understand, but maybe because I wasn't very good at coloring for for real, I still can't stay inside the lines. I tried it, it wasn't relaxing, it was very stressful for me, but I wasn't good at it. So, you figure out how to engage in that right brain. Maybe it's that you do some sort of creative writing exercise, maybe you escape into Halo, I don't know. But you use your brain. Minecraft apparently can be one of those things that you can do where you build things and it's computer based. Most of you who ever did coding, anybody here ever do programming and coding? Did you love it? You know why? Because it's creative. Right? And you get to see an output instantly. Doing a little bit of coding and then solving a work problem will actually give you better resolution to whatever problem. You will come up with better solutions. 
quick scan. Can't pay attention to a specific tasks, doesn't seem to listen to and spoken to, difficulty in organizing tasks and activities, reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort, and easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. Anybody has followed this? Yes? You can now get really awesome drugs. 90% <laughs> of all adults will say yes to that assessment. It is the way we define ADHD. I would argue, and lots of researchers would argue, that ADHD is actually a misnomer because what we're suffering from is information overload. We have too much information coming in for our brains to process it, and it's not because our brains aren't capable, it's because we have too much information around us all the time, and it dilutes our ability to focus singularly on the thing at hand. So we have to get to a place where we start working on that. How do you do it? Number one, email. Stop with the email. Email is the devil. <laughs> I fundamentally believe that. People think that email has emotion attached to it. They're always trying to figure out your underlying issues. You copied everybody on the planet on the emails, right? Getting rid of email is pretty easy. I don't mean you don't ever use it. I mean you set boundaries with your email. I have people tell me every day, I can't stop checking my email when I'm on vacation. My boss expects me to. Well, then your boss should come to this class because what he's doing or she's doing is destroying their employees. You can't do that. People have to be able to take a break. I set boundaries on my email. I put these really awesome things called out of office messages out there. You can email me this week, you've gotten it. And you know what I really use it for? It's a screen. I'm sorry if you've emailed me and I haven't responded to you because now I'm totally telling my secret. <laughs> I go through and figure out which ones can I handle quickly and I might get to those. Because the bigger ones that are going to take me more time, I'm going to get to next week when I actually have time to dedicate mental capacity to their Questions. I use out of office messages probably three days out of every week. Or I'm writing currently, I will get back to you. As long as you tell people we're going to get back to them within a reasonable time frame, they will wait. You can manage expectations. Now, sometimes they start texting you, and that's a whole separate discussion about boundaries, right? But email, we have to figure out how to handle. My favorite area to really think about is sort of spirituality in terms of what do we value, what are our behaviors, and are they actually reflective of the kinds of things we want to do? I had this conversation last night in my house. My son, who's seven, decided to be part of a woman hating club. <laughs> yes, Rick. I know. It apparently comes from the Little Rascals movie, which he's never seen, but his best friend decided to create this he-man woman hating club. <coughs> and so he joins in. And he makes a little red-headed girl, who reminds me of the little girl, Charlie Brown, cry. And so I get the call from the teacher last week about this whole situation. So last night we had this big discussion about, tell me times you were most proud of yourself. And I was most proud of myself when I stood up for somebody at school that was being bullied, or there was a little girl that got knocked down and she was bleeding, or there was a little girl that got kicked by a boy and he tackled him. So every recollection in his brain of something that he did that was proper, involved protecting somebody, not hurting them. I was like, so what kind of value does that tell you that you actually want to operate from, right? And so we have these conversations. We never think about it in the public sector. We never think about it as adults. When is our behavior the best and when are we the most proud of it? Can you identify it right now? Specific behaviors that you've been most proud of. <coughs> the times where you took time to shut your laptop down, to shut your phone off, and actually focus on the person in front of you, whoever that person is. Right? Maybe that's it. The other issue we have right now that we're all suffering from, and I suffer from it extremely, and I was reflecting on it on my drive this morning, compassion fatigue. We are entirely too selfless. We say yes to everything. I'm on the PTA. They're trying to get me to be president. But every president they've ever had has been a non-working mom. And I'm like, why would I say yes to this? Well, then I feel guilty if I don't say yes, right? So we have all this sort of guilt. The, the guilt never ends. God, why did somebody not tell me that before I had children? But I'm on the PTA. I'm also apparently the chair of the field day. I'm swim team mom. I organize all the volunteers for all the swim meets. I have, like, people in my life that are supposed to help. And, oh, by the way, when my parents call and say, we're wanting to move your grandmother, can you send an email to the director, you know, basically accusing them of abuse? I do that too. And then I get roped into the conversation with the director who I've never met before, ever. 
and I'm probably going to get sued by <laughs> defamation of character or something, but I do it all, right? You try to do it all. So what you have to do is think about what you stand for, what you want, and how your choices are affecting others. <clears throat> Every day, you can make an active choice to use the most awesome button. You can turn things off. You can say this really powerful word. How many of you have ever said no? I have been fascinated with the CGCIO process. I've had so many people mad, mad at me this year because we are restricting it down to 40 people and making people compete. And everybody's mad at me. And by the way, I'm okay with that. You know why? Because I've, if I've made you mad, then at least you show me you care. Because otherwise you're apathetic. Right? The opposite of love is not hate, it's apathy. Right? And so, at least I know you care. But the beauty of saying no means that I'm going to be able to give what I think is a better quality experience because I'm limiting how many people I need to focus on. I feel bad for the class this year. I don't feel like I have done them the service that I have historically wanted to do in my classes because I've been trying to deal with entirely too many students. I mean, Barbara and Antonio, I'm sorry, you can come next year for free, whatever, right? <laughs> Except we don't really have any seats for you, you can stand up. Um, we have to figure out how to do this more often in our lives. How do you start? You have to be aware. Every week, I create lists. Does anybody create lists? Do you love lists? I love lists. I love lists because I love marking stuff off of lists. I email myself lists. I now text myself lists. I have a list app on my phone, and there's nothing better than actually writing a list. So I always write my list. So every week, in order for me to sort of get into the mind space of actually focusing on life at home and, and work and, and how I do that, I write a list. I take a piece of paper, it's yellow, it sits in my car, it's folded in half. On one side is work. Work list. Here are the things I need to get done this week. And by the way, nothing. I love marking them off, right? On the other side is life list. I get in my car on the way to work after I drop my son in school and I put the, life, the work list on the seat next to me. Because you know I'm going to be distracted driving anyway, so it's better than texting, I think. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking down, and by the time I spend my 45-minute commute to Chapel Hill, I am fully focused on work, and I forgot that I was mom. And at work, I'm not mom. I'm Shannon. At home, I'm mom, and I get that. And so then, when I get in my car to go home in the afternoon, so number one, the first thing I do is not listen to the radio. I do not listen to the radio. It is absolutely silent. I do not answer my phone in the car. It is absolutely silent in my car because it's the time, it's about the only time I get where nobody talks to me, right? Because otherwise they're in the bathroom with you. I mean, they talk in their sleep. It doesn't matter. And I look at my life list and there's things on there like remember to play, do the laundry, buy milk, remember to say I love you, remember to hug. Right? Things I shouldn't have to remind myself of, but there's something about that process of flipping that piece of paper over to the life list that gets me into a different space. On the times I have forgotten to flip the list, I kid you not, my son knows. And he doesn't know anything about the list. The list is hidden from him because he would probably draw on it and then that would make me angry. He knows nothing about the list. And he says to me, Mommy, I'm not sure why, but you're using your Shannon voice today instead of your mommy voice. And, and the mommy voice can get the mean voice too, right? But there's a Shannon voice that's me talking at him versus me talking with him. And he knows the difference. He's known the difference since he was a little kid. You also have to start practicing. It's going to take forever, by the way. I mess this up every week, every day, all the time. You build rituals and you figure out what you're doing right. Stop beating yourself up about the stuff you didn't do. Do not worry about what you didn't get done. Do not worry about the time you yelled at your kid when he didn't really deserve it. Okay, I'm trying to soothe myself, right? But you want to focus on what you're actually doing right, not what you've done wrong, not what you're resisting doing. And figure out where you're wasting your time, because I promise you, you are lying to yourself somewhere in this space. Oh, it's a priority. My work is a priority. I have to get this done for my boss. Now, you probably think you have to get this done for your boss, because that's how you derive your self-worth, which is okay. But at least own it and know it, so that you don't waste your time. These are my last two statements and we're going to be out of here. The first question that I have is the life you're living worth the price you're living or you're paying to live it. I have this on my mirror. Every time my son says, I want, or why don't we have a bigger house, or why don't we do this, I go back and I go look. Well, see this right here? 
We live in this size house. It's not nearly as big as your friend's house because it means mommy can take you on vacation this year. By the way, when was the last time they went on vacation? Right? It's like, well, why do you have to work during the day and not pick me up from school at 3 p.m. every single day? Like, because the times I do have to work late are probably 20%. 80% of the time, I'm home with you. I travel about 10% of the time. I choose actively to be home with you. And most kids don't get that. And when I'm home with you, I'm really focused on you. So we have these sorts of conversations. The last thing that I think is really important is to remember that they like you at work, but they love you at home. Whatever that home means to you, what I have added to this sort of corollary, that's a common statement. I've added this one. When I'm at work, I'm 100% focused on work. I'm not thinking about the fight I had with my spouse. I'm not thinking about my kid and his need to brush his teeth while wearing no underwear. Right? I'm not thinking about any, I, he doesn't really do that, but I'm not thinking about any of those sorts of issues. I'm thinking about work, because I am Shannon at work. And the minute I get home, I do not let anything from work bother me. I might check my email at 10 o'clock at night after everybody's in bed. And that's only if I really have a weird gap in my time where I'm not focused on something else or someone else or myself. By and large, my work day ends when I leave work. And if you email me on the weekends, I don't know that you'll ever get a response from me. Because I'm not working. I don't get paid to work those hours. I set really clear boundaries. I'm going to let you guys go. If you have questions about this, stay here and we will talk until I got nowhere to go except to a party at 7. All right. Thank you all.